Imagine with me if we could change the entire public narrative, all the negative stereotypes about the young people that we serve. And imagine if we had an equal seat at the policy table to adequately share the needs and the experiences of those young people. And imagine also if we could actually eliminate these problems altogether. So my talk really, in, in a little bit of general terms, is trying to take musings like that and turn them into some sort of reality, or at least get us on a path towards that reality. So I'm gonna use youth homelessness as an example kind of throughout the talk, um, but I do believe that, that most of what I'm talking about really applies to all social services and all the work that we're doing. So a few years back, I was part of a strategic planning process with an organization and uh, we received this edict all the way from the top that said, goal number one for your, uh, for your strategic, strategic planning process is end youth homelessness. And I'm thinking to myself the whole time like, yes, now we're talking. But there's another director in the room, he kind of scoffs a little bit and he says, end youth homelessness, this is ridiculous. Why are we gonna set a goal that we can't achieve? And that's when my heart sank because it was kind of the, one of the first times when I realized how far we've actually gotten from being able to put together legitimate solutions to end these problems. See, I think we've been pushed so far into this small picture survival mentality that we've lost sight of what the big picture is. Do we actually believe that we can end these crises that plague our youth? And I don't mean just as a soundbite and say, I'm trying to put myself out of business, but do we actually believe that we can end this? See, I think social service providers hold the key to solving some of our most challenging social crises. We and our youth are essential experts. We're experts on the ground. We have an intimate knowledge about the complexities that our kids face. Poverty, inequality, racism, broken education systems, broken foster care systems, et cetera, et cetera. We also have intimate knowledge about the legislative gaps and the unintended barriers that are created by legislations. And maybe most of all, we have intimate knowledge about the hearts and the minds and the potential of these kids. But our voice and their voice has rarely been heard within a lot of these processes. We've so often shied away from the sharing our expertise, our knowledge from the kids, from the staff, back into the public process. But why is that? So there's a number of reasons for this, and a lot of this comes from the research that I've been doing most recently. There's, there's a couple of historical reasons why we have a lack of voice. So charitable organizations kind of originally uh, created to kind of you know, fill gaps that, that weren't being provided by, by the larger public systems. Oftentimes they're born out of a religious call, doing good work with an altruistic mission. Rarely were these things designed to have politics or system reform or social reform as kind of a part of, part of that element. Well, not long after you know, we sort of get this stuff started, the government realizes, hey, it's a lot cheaper to provide all these necessary services by subcontracting out to nonprofit organizations, right? And in turn, we sort of became extensions oftentimes to the government as opposed to real true partners having conversations. On top of this, we've got the IRS, which set all kinds of guidelines about what kind of work we can do, what kind of work we can't do under our 501c3s most of which we have no idea what any of it means. So there was a recent national survey of nonprofits where they asked nonprofits a whole series of questions about what they were allowed to do, what they weren't allowed to do under, under IRS guidelines. And for the most part, um, well, I should say, more than half of the organizations interviewed had absolutely no idea, were completely wrong with, with the understanding of what they were allowed to do and what they weren't allowed to do as far as advocacy and lobbying. There's a couple of theoretical reasons too, and this is where sort of like my you know, academic side pops into this conversation. So there's two, two key theoretical pieces kind of coming together with this. This idea of resource dependence, that's pretty simple, right? So 
uh, if an organization, a social service organization, is dependent on scarce resources, uh, dependent on the government for those resources, we're quite simply not going to bite the hand that feeds us. And this applies to kind of all funders along the way. Um, the other one is something called institutional isomorphism. Fancy words that ultimately just mean there's a nonprofit normative culture. It's kind of already been established. And when we as organizations are trying to make decisions uh, on the strategies or the activities that we're going to engage in, we tend to look back at that normative culture and say, hey, what, what should we be doing? Let's look to, that, let's look to the norms um, to, to, to make those decisions. Um, we simply act and behave the way nonprofits are supposed to act, right? There's a couple of practical reasons, too. So a, a lot, I'm, I'm kind of preaching to the choir here. You guys probably know all, all about all these things on a daily basis. Practical implications and why we don't have much voice in the process. We have a resource allocation problem. We have scarce resources, finite scarce resources. We're taking those scarce resources and we're making decisions the best we can to put those where we think it's going to have the most impact or where it's, where it's best put. And most of the time we're choosing programs, right? We're, we're choosing to put our money into whatever can help kids the most on the ground. Very rarely do we feel like we have the flexibility or the additional resources to do advocacy or policy or you know, this kind of you know, bigger picture look into things. And that feels like you know, it's, uh, we just don't, we can't do everything we want to do. Um, we also feel like we have a lack of specialized skills that are required to do that kind of work, advocacy and policy work. It sort of feels like it's something that's, that's very skill-based and we don't, we don't really have those skills within us. We feel like we don't, I think we do, but um, for the most part, we look at it and say, we're trained and we're skilled to work with youth and that's where we're gonna keep our focus. So our reality is this, social service providers, we are faced with incredible challenges to survive. We're making incredibly tough choices every single day towards that survival. And in the, in the, in the midst of all this, we're, we're doing incredible, amazing, essential work, but we're losing the war. The problems that we're trying to address are growing faster than we can possibly keep up. I heard the stat earlier today uh, from Mike, who was pointing out that the research in Philadelphia is showing that it looks like we're about 5,000 young people experiencing homelessness each year. And you kind of measure that to the amount of kids that we can reach through the programs that we have, and we're simply not getting there. So here's another example. National Coalition for the Homeless recently stated that there's one bed for every 125 young people experiencing homelessness in the United States. One bed for every 125 people, young people experiencing homelessness. But then we, we, we find out a little bit more, and we learn things over time about doubling up. We learn more about human trafficking. We learn how to do better targeted point-in-time counts so that we have a better sense of what these numbers are. And all of a sudden we realize, whoa, the problems are even bigger than we initially imagined. See, we need the audacity to be the vision casters. We can be jaded about the flawed systems, the broken systems that we're working within, or we can lead into something new. That's all of us and all of our kids. We can lead into something new. But we have to go back to that original question. Do we actually believe that we can end the crises that plague our kids? And I say we better. So how do we actually do this? I think this boils down to two uh, key elements that we've historically struggled with. The first is advocacy. And when I talk about advocacy, I don't just mean you know, your annual trips to Washington where you're meeting with representatives or meeting with your representatives in city council, but I'm talking about true, big, full-scale public advocacy. And this is the idea that you know, we, need, we need a cultural shift. We need to change people's hearts. And we can do that. We, we do that through building relationships. We do that through connecting donors to kids. We do that through breaking down stereotypes. And we do that through, through telling the real complex things that our young people are facing. See, we, we need to have a new kind of leadership that's speaking out in a new kind of way. And I think that we can be the leaders on those issues. People are drawn to that kind of bold, confident leadership. And I know that there's the fear of scarce resources, but I've also seen it where we actually take a stand and we have really strong, meaningful, relationship-building leadership, and all of a sudden, the money starts to flow. 
The second area is strategic partnership. And when I talk about strategic partnership, I don't just mean that we're sharing federal grant responsibilities with some other organization, but I'm talking about true partnership. I'm talking about the issue that, that the, 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 the problems that we're facing right now, the problems that our young people are facing are inherently complex. And complex problems are gonna require complex solutions. So for example, we simply can't solve youth homelessness without also addressing poverty, inequality, racism, broken foster care systems, broken education systems, and all those other hosts of, of symptoms that are kind of leading us to this thing. We simply have to partner across these fields. We cannot operate in silos anymore. So here's our call to action. Dream big. And by this I mean Let's actually dream about where it is that we're trying to go. Let's develop that dream. Think really big. Do this with your organization, but think bigger than your organization. Think bigger than just simply three to five years out, where do we want to be? Go big. And when you're doing shorter term goals, tie those goals to that big picture vision, but make sure that that's kind of where we're headed. And you can check yourself along the way. Be bold. We are not just charitable organizations doing good work. We are essential leaders in this fight. We have to have a seat at that table. Advocacy is scary, oftentimes. Advocacy feels opulent most of the time. But we have a responsibility to share those stories, to share those experiences of our kids, or help them share those experiences even better. Strategic partnership, I think, is even harder, right? Because oftentimes, our biggest financial competitors are going to be our strongest allies in that big picture vision. But that's absolutely essential because complex problems require complex solutions. Take the lead. We have an incredible amount of expertise, a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of experience, both with our kids and in the work that we're doing with them. We have to share that widely. We can no longer just let our organization's work, fee, work speak for itself. We have to take that expertise out to the masses. There's no, one, no one's against solving these problems. We're talking about kids. We're talking about kids on the street. People are desperate for leadership on these issues. They crave leadership on these issues. And you know, when there's a void in leadership, somebody's gonna go fill it. Usually somebody that we don't really want to fill that leadership role, right? Imagine again, if we could actually eliminate the problems that we face. Dream big, be bold, and take the lead. Thank you so much.